Uh, I can communicate with RAF databases, uh, with Alexa, with Domino. Uh, I'm pretty much just limited by my imagination. And it's everywhere. We see it in the browser, of course, on the server with Node.js, uh, on our mobile devices, and on the desktop with uh, um, especially with Visual Basic Code. Uh, that's the editor I use. It's, it was developed using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. And it's an excellent editor. I would have to say probably one of the better ones out there. And a while back, there was a lot of talk about vanilla JS, though it did cause some confusion. But it was really, uh, and there was a website called Vanilla JS. I think it's just vanilla. Oh uh, no, vanillajs.com. And what it was is a satire site, right? It was a joke. Um, and so you would go to this this website and you would pick a bunch of check boxes of the features that you wanted to use in your application, and you would offer a download button. You would download it. You'd get a vanilla JS uh, vanilla.js file, and you would open it up, and it was just the there was nothing there. Uh, and they even continued the satire with saying, well, in your development environment, just add the script tag, and then when you go to production, get rid of it. <laughs> so, so what features are driving today's techniques? Uh, we have rapid development, uh, run anywhere, reusable, easy to share code, uh, we're make it, starting to make it easier to write maintainable code because we're seeing classes. And if you include TypeScript in here, we're starting to see uh, uh, familiar Java constructs like enums and maps and lists. Uh, all of these things are being brought into uh, JavaScript to make it more stable, more, um, more robust, if you want to say. And because of this, um, JavaScript is still growing exponentially. It's been around forever and it's still growing. Um, and it's also being used more and more in IT workshops to drive their development workflow, uh, which just drives the need for more JavaScript development for tools and, and utilities. And it's also extremely easy to share our code via things like Bitbucket and GitHub. If we develop something cool, we can put it up on one of these um, uh, Git repositories and people can download it and share it and change it and even commit code back to us via a pull request. So it's extremely shareable. And uh, um, what's driving a lot of this shareability is uh, NPM. And so how many here know what NPM is? A few. How many of you have uh, published your own NPM module? I expect that you. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you work for a company that has published an NPM module? Of course, yes. <laughs> so I guess that brings us to what is a node module? Um, or what is NPM? It, it, it is a, a package manager. Uh, it came about in January of 2010. Uh, and it's just a place to share and distribute node modules. And a node module is just a piece of code that, that solves a single solution. For example, there are file system uh, a mod a module up there just for working with file system. Uh, or there's also a path module just for working with paths. So it just solves a single problem. Uh, NPM is also included in the installation of NJS. Uh, there are over 10 million developers and tens of thousands of companies that use NPM to build their uh, uh, just amazing things that they use every day that's powering their websites, that's powering their internet, that's, that's driving their developer workflow. And the growth of NPM has actually been quite great. Uh, it's outpacing uh, 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 even a lot of the more popular uh, package managers out there. 
Um, and some of these package managers were like the standard, such as Maven, which has been around forever. Um, and Bauer, also Bauer <laughs> is actually, you can't even hardly see it on this chart, where just a few years ago, it was probably one of the more popular uh, package managers out there. And, but we do need to, to mention that there are people out there that say 90% of everything is crap. And that's probably true, but the other 10% really solves hard problems or simple problems that otherwise you would have to solve it yourself, but someone's already done it for you. And so that to me is one of the greatest powers of NPM. If I need a solution to something, I go look there first because I'll probably find something. And if it doesn't exactly fit my needs, well, I can modify it to fit my needs. So using JavaScript back in 2010, you probably had something like this in, the web, in your web app. Um, and to get to this, you probably went through a process similar to this. You would browse the web and download some JavaScript file you had added to your project and it didn't work. So you'd read the documentation and change the order of your script tags and it still didn't work. On and on and on, and just repeat for everything you wanted to add to your project. Well, NPM actually helped solve this. Uh, so now, if you want to use one of these modules, you run npm install with your package name, and then you import it into your JavaScript file, and that's it. NPM handles all the other dependency management and order of, uh, the order of how things should be loaded. It just does it all for you. You no longer have to go through that big mess of script tags. Though I do need to bring up Bower because it is still a relevant package manager. However, when you install it, it tells you, hey, Bower has been deprecated. Maybe you should go look at something else. But there are still an awful lot of modules out, out there being surfaced in Bower. For example, Polymer. Uh, if you're using Polymer 1 or 2, you're still tied to Bower because that's where all of the elements are stored that you might want to use. Um, when Polymer 3, well, Polymer 3 is out, it is using modules instead. So that's starting to move stuff away from Bower. However, the message is still disturbing when you install Bower and it says, hey, it's deprecated. Maybe you should use something else. And so today with uh, ECMAScript 6, we now have proper classes uh, and proper module support and very good editors with, with great type ahead control, and that type ahead even works across multiple files. And we also have TypeScript. And so what is TypeScript exactly? It was uh, developed by Microsoft, and it is a superset of JavaScript. All right, so it just adds type, strong types to JavaScript. It is JavaScript, basically. However, you can now add strong types to it, and you get a lot of the familiar constructs with enums, maps, and the like. And it compiles down to JavaScript, and you can tell it that you want ECMAScript 5, 6, 7, 4. But I don't know if that's a problem before you know. I don't know. Not sure. Um, but, and it fills up. When you're writing TypeScript, to me, it feels very Java-like, right? Because you can define custom types and emails and you know, these sorts of things. Uh, or define static properties and methods. Uh, where in JavaScript, you, you can, but it's not as um, intuitive in how to do it. And so, the use of TypeScript to write JavaScript is also gaining a lot of traction. Uh, there's typings out there for pretty much everything, anything that you want to use. Uh, Moment has been a very popular library for manipulating dates. Uh, there's typings there for it. 
And by these companies providing typings or the community providing typings, um, you get very strong type ahead support. So even if a library isn't well documented, it's easy to figure out how to use it just because of the strong type ahead support. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to go spelunking into their code also, right? Because our editors can provide a link to the, the type and then you can figure out how they put it all together and how it's supposed to work. Uh, it's not a very steep learning curve because it's just JavaScript. And so you probably already know JavaScript. And so why is NPM important to us? Uh, mainly because Node is coming to Dominate. Um, and we'll probably start writing more Node modules to, to do things with our Domino data. And it provides, um, it can also provide an alternative to the Domino web engine. Though in 10, I understand we're getting HTTP2 support. Uh, right now, we do not have that support, so it's easy to stand a Node server up in front of Domino to provide HTTP2 support to Domino data. The second pillar of reusability is uh, starter kits. And so how many of you have developed your own starter kit or maybe a custom template that you use for every application? No? Uh, and how many of you have said that you must use that starter kit for every new application? No matter the application, you use the starter kit. No. Um, and so what do we expect from it to start again? So some of the things we expect are automated testing. We want all of our JavaScript to be bundled up into a single file and minify it. Uh, or maybe even into multiple files and minify it. That way we can lazy load the things as we need them. Uh, we want an automated build and updates. We want it to be modular, linear. Um, provide source maps so we can troubleshoot our production code and an operable application shell um, which is easily branded that we can add whatever our customer's brand is to it so we don't have to go through a lot of uh, trouble trying to figure that out. And most importantly from it, we want to be able to go on vacation once we deploy an application with it. And so what we really want is that. Right? That, that's the, 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 the real goal. However, getting to that single file is quite difficult and requires um, a lot of learning and searching the web and trial and error. And by putting it into a starter kit, you get rid of all that trial and error leading up to getting to this. Plus, to get to that single import, you have to answer a lot of questions for each project, right? Which editor are you going to use? Which package manager? Which JavaScript framework? Um, how about task manager? How will your project be structured? Where will you place all your class files and elements? And, and the, this list is quite large. It's over 50 questions that need to be answered for every single application. And learning to do this is a lot like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and also, you have to ask yourself, honestly, will you remember to do this or to answer these questions for each and every project? Now, I know a lot of you are saying that I'm a professional. I know how to create an application. And I agree with you, you do. But, Will the answers to all those questions be the same for each application? I, I, I don't think that they will. And even if everything is answered the same, will everything still be structured the same? Will it still be put in the same place and it have the same naming conventions? Probably not. Um, and I say that because as you grow as a developer, the way you think, the way you solve problems, the, work, the way you write code is constantly changing. And if it, all your projects are constantly changing, someone can't come along behind you while you're on vacation and solve a problem or implement a new feature. 
And so, I do not believe in final project. And the reason why is it makes it more difficult for you to go on vacation, right? Uh, and it's not productive. You end up repeating mistakes between projects and it forces you to create or implement everything from scratch every single time, which to me makes no sense. We want to be able to reuse the thoughts and opinions that we've that we built over the years. So why not just codify it? Using Node.js, we can build tools that will codify all these decisions for us. And then everything is the same every single time. And if your opinions change, you can always go back and include it in your starter kit. And with the starter kit, now you can include your company's opinions and rules around how an application should be built. All your files will still be located in the same place every time between the projects. Things will work the same between projects. Uh, the testing techniques and libraries that you use for automated testing will be the same throughout the projects. Um, and compilation of all this will be the same between projects and you're never hit with a big surprise of why is this different. Now I've got to sit down and figure this out, which can end up being a big time suck. And it also makes it easy for different members of your team to come along behind you, or you to come along behind them. And if your opinions change, just change your starter kit. And if it's a big change, you can include it in the setup as a choice. Right? Do you want to use Angular, or do you want to use Vue, or React, or whatever? and just include these things in your starter kit. A pro tip here is to make whatever changes a note its own node module. Now it can be shared somewhere else. And so how do we approach uh, starter kits? Uh, we developed a project called Red Pills Ion. It is still an R&D project at the moment. And the way we use it is we just clone the Red Pills Ion um, repository into our project directory um, and then open up the command line, run npm run setup. It'll run npm install and Bower install for us. It'll ask us a few questions and that's it. And then we're ready to start developing code. We run npm run start and we end up with a web server that's spun up locally, surfacing data from whatever Domino server we want to proxy it from. And as we make changes to our code, this browser is refreshed automatically for us. And all of that's just included in the starter kit. It includes all of our opinions, implementation of our custom elements, uh, and our code style guidelines. We enforce that as well. And so some of the benefits of, of, of using a starter kit is uh, we end up with an app shell that follows the purple pattern, except for push, until we get HTTP2. Uh, we end up with a service worker, so our application works offline. Uh, we can add it to our home screen on our mobile devices. We get all this automatically. Uh, we already have a, a routing system, and TypeScript is already implemented and bigger than works. Uh, we also have tools for initializing and compiling the application already there. Uh, and it enforces uh, Red Pill Now's code style guidelines via JSCS. So we even develop the, the, the rules and how code should be formatted in order to make it easier to read. Uh, we have editor config files, all the directories and examples for creating models and new web elements. And I can show you. Uh, All right, so I've already cloned Zion, and I've already run npm install and Bower install simply because we can't depend on Wi-Fi. And so this is what we would end up starting with. 
uh, for a new project. In this case, I'll just call it Collab Designer. And so I would come here run VM, run setup. And this will run through right and ask me a few questions. Do I want to delete the Git repository? What's the project name? And some uh, package.json. So when this thing fires up, it immediately opens up a demo site. It includes our code style guidelines for HTML and JavaScript. And it also uh, shows examples of using some of the elements that are contained within our starter kit. And this is a site that was developed using Zyma. So it, it just provides a good example. Sorry. And so once we're ready to develop code, oh, notice that we give it the collab namespace, so now we've renamed all of our stuff and added the collab namespace. Even in our class files, we get collab namespace. And our class names were all populated for us. And all of this is working code. And so it's done a lot of work for us. And so now once we're ready to start developing our application code, we can run npm run start, and this will fire up a web server looking at our source directory. And we end up with a working application. And again, it's following the red pill style guidelines, which is uh, uh, material, is our version of material design. It all works. We end up with internationalization support. And so this is the power of, of, a, of a starter kit. And then if we make a change,
And so, and also for further testing, we can uh, see what that looks like in a browser just to make sure that our production build will work. Oh, I forgot it runs through the compile again. Sorry about that. <coughs> it will do the same thing. It'll fire up a, a web browser serving files from our disk directory. That way we get to test the production build to make sure everything still works the way we think it should work. <coughs> And as you can see, we still get everything. We still get our internationalization support. Our routing still works. And so that's our process for using Red Pill Zion. And so what this, this process does is Let's us take things for granted. Like when you got up this morning, you took a lot of things for granted. That when you turn the light on next to your bed, that the light would actually come on. You go into the restroom and turn the handle, that water would come out of the faucet. Uh, that I would be here and my laptop would be charged and that it would work. Uh, well, Red Pill Zion allows us to take for granted that all the things we need to build an application are there for us. And so, and honestly, that just makes it easier for us to be able to go on vacation because anyone coming behind you can also take these things for granted. They know where the models are. They know where to manipulate the routes. They know everything that they need to know in order to solve the problem. So the third pillar of reusability is uh, web components and so over the past few years I've become more and more passionate about web components uh, mainly because of their simplicity and that it's uh, uh, it, it forces you to abstract things out to, to look at the simplest part of a large problem and pack it piece by piece instead of the whole thing So what is a web component? It's an encapsulated UI widget. Think of it as a, it's its own HTML tag. It's the same thing as a div or an anchor link or a list item or a list. It follows that same pattern. Uh, and it's a first class citizen on the web. And it's just a building block for building an application. And this building block is of the smallest down to the smallest thing that you might find on a website. For example, an avatar would be a custom web component. You hand it a note's name, and if there's a picture in the Domino directory, you would get the picture. Um, if there's not a picture, you just get a letter, and we even create a color for based on the name, so everybody has their own color. And all of this is encapsulated in a web component that we can reuse anywhere. And all you have to hand it is a notes name. And we don't have to develop it for each and every application. And so there is a web component standard. Uh, version one of that standard came out last year. I believe it was announced at Google I.O. 2017. Uh, and all the major browser vendors have committed to implementing version one of that standard. Uh, and it actually consists of four standards, uh, HTML imports, and that one is probably going to go away. The only people who have implemented that at the moment is Chrome. Uh, however, it's still being used, uh, and in Polymer 3, they are using modules, so it will go away from Chrome soon also. Uh, you have HTML templates uh, that is implemented currently by all the major browsers. Uh, custom elements, uh, we still need some polyfills uh, for that piece of the web, uh, web component standard and Shadow DOM is also still currently needing a polyfill. Uh, but it's building blocks for a web application. If we look at 
uh, can I use, at least I think that's what it is. Uh, for uh, HTML imports, you can see pretty much Chrome is the only ones who, who ever implemented HTML imports. Firefox has said repeatedly that they refuse. So, uh, HTML templates, you can see that's across all the major browsers except for IE. IE is no longer supported, so who cares? Uh, the version one of custom elements. One one. Yes. <laughs> version one of custom elements is being implemented in, um, of course, Chrome, Safari, iOS, Safari. And I know Firefox and Edge have committed to implementing it. And then we have the Shadow DOM, uh, which is a similar situation as uh, custom elements. So these, that, this is why the web element is a first class citizen. It's treated just like any other HTML tag already built into your browser. And then there's Polymer, which is mainly a wrapper around creating and using web elements. Uh, it, it was uh, created and is maintained by Google, uh, and it provides a lot of syntactic sugar around working with web elements. It makes it a lot easier to, to, to understand exactly what's going on. And they also provide a lot of utilities for building entire apps using just Polymer. Uh, they also have a very good element, custom element library that implements every type, type of field you can think of, um, I, along with just basic fields. Right, if there's a web element just for an input. Uh, but they, their biggest piece of this is the elements that they provide that implement material design. And these would be all the paper elements if you go looking into this. Uh, they're now starting to provide type script definitions for all their elements, so you get strong type ahead support in your editor as you're using them. Um, and the current stable version of Polymer is three, but most people are still on two and one. Not many people have started moving into three yet. Mm -hmm. Mainly because not uh, Google's uh, uh, element library is not available on NPM yet, though they are moving in there. There's also a good open source component library where you can find web components of all types. It's webcomponents.org. Uh, you can find all of Google's elements there. Uh, you can uh, find elements from Biden that implement their client-side grid, which is very good. Uh, also, the Biden combo boxes, which are very good. Uh, and this is also where the open source community dumps all their elements. So before you create your own, come here and look. You know, odds are someone else has already done it. And so does Red Pill now have any open source web components? Yes, this is our GitHub repository. There are a few there, not a whole lot, uh, but I am adding to them as I create them. Um, and hopefully this will kind of turn into a large library of web components for problems that we've already addressed. Uh, the biggest uh, problem with us open sourcing our web components is that they already include our opinions and most people don't. You know, they don't want uh, red pill styling on their elements. Um, and so I've got a demo of one of our simple read-only uh, element for surfacing rich tags. <coughs> and this was actually one of the first uh, web elements that I developed. Uh, I, I even blogged about it, I believe. Can you think of the text at all? And so, what makes up a web element is you define its dependencies, and these are HTML imports. I'm sure you've seen link tags before, but you notice the rel is import. And so that just pulls in the libraries that I need to support this element. 
then you have your element definition. And so to use this, my tag name will be now rich text. And then within this, we have a template that defines the markup for our element along with its style. And then a script block, which defines the API for our element. Uh, one of the great things about uh, uh, Polymer is we get observers. So when the rich text object property changes, I can run a method and do something, such as convert base 64 on all the uh, uh, images, or use the quoted printable uh, decoder in order to, to convert, um, I think it's a MIME object, one of the MIME object formats that come down on a rich text field if you use EBS, this will convert it. Also, one of the great things about using Polymer is that you get automated documentation with your components. So as long as you fill in the comments for your methods and properties, you'll get documentation. And this page is one of their elements. And then you can see a demo of how your element works. And it shows you how it was used. So here you can see it's just an HTML tag called now rich text with a rich text object property or a tribute that uses a little bit of data binding. Yes? These, these components, I mean, that's, this one is tied to pop. There's, there's a dependency on these things. I mean, I mean, I mean whether you're using a React or a, depending on the web, the web library we're using. Yes. So they are very, from my understanding, I haven't done much with Angular since Angular 1. But from my understanding, they are right now starting to create their own components. They, they make it appear that it's within their ecosystem, ecosystem but it's actually just a web component. But if you want to use Polymer, yes, Polymer then becomes a dependency of your project. I mean, the, the constant, you, you, you mentioned the you know, web components and they're, are they, are they standard, are they standard, for example, for Polymer, or are they, are they standard across? Okay, good question. Do not have to use Polymer. You can use just plain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Polymer just gives you syntactic sugar around it. Okay. So the web compiles by the HTML full spec. <clears throat> As long as you have a browser that supports the HTML full spec, it also probably fills what's missing in your browser. Yes. So if the HTML imports keep the showing, Chrome will do that and full. Exactly. But if the poly fills running, it'll just work. And all of them makes it easy. And you can mix and match. Like you can write one component in React, another one in Vue, another one in Ember, another one in uh, Polymer. Uh, Polymer and then bring them all together on the one. You might have a lot of dependencies that you're loading. Yeah, it was You're not locked in that if you just, you do using Angular today, you write all your components, then you decide yeah, to go. Yeah, that was my yeah, real question. You don't have to rewrite them all. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And no, these are meant to be used anywhere. Yeah. I haven't tried it. I've, I've even mentioned it in other conferences that I want to try it. But I assume that these would even work in X benches. I had to try it, but I would assume that they would work in the And so that's all I have. I want to thank you for sure. attending. And it, does anyone have any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the
So maybe the dogs that had to Yeah. 
Did you know the Oh, yeah. You know did you attend? No. Or did, remember the two guys from Oliver? Oh, you just No, I did not. This year. Oh, you two. Okay. So everybody was on YouTube. It was like you were there. Did you make any photos on the No. No, no Sam yeah. wanted me. Yeah. Yeah. He was trying to arrange an Airbnb with me. We did that. We did that. The first year of Paul, we watched it live. Yeah, and yeah, just yeah. blocked the names off work and sat and watched Paul. Yeah. Because it came on. Because they liked it. Yeah, they released the videos later. Last year. Yeah, I didn't did block the day off. I just had a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of something called my anchors. And finally, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I can imagine. You know, it sounds like you did too. Hey, that's where a lot of the water bottles. So I thought the game was going to be a little bit of 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 a little well, this is kind of I think it's tomorrow night. You mean there's still a user group? No, 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 so nobody else uses your stuff. Nobody. No one. Are you like a in-house developer somewhere? No, I work for business partner, same as you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's why we kind of took the approach that we hope you're watching. If, if you want to tell us how to do it, we're not your because if you tell us, oh, we want an X page of that patient does this, that, and never we're going to tell you, no, we won't do that. Yeah. X page is done. Like, it's JSF. Come on. Yeah. We wrote, we used to write some JSF. There's still a very large JSF community that the JSF engine and X pages is dead. JSF never, people like the vision of it, but it's server side state. Yes. Nobody wants to steal it. Server yeah. wants to steal it. Which is why I'm running the, the server side. Server yeah. for PCs. Yeah, that's why I'm moving to the client side. Thank you. It's not because of trying to. If you're not embedding in something, you're not embedding in poorly. You're not embedding